How was the video last week? Oh, was it? Good. We had fun uh, kind of recording that one. It was kind of new, kind of different, something new, you know. Uh, that, would you believe me if I said, told you that was me? <laughs> we're, we're talking about failing. We're talking about, you know, missing the boat when it comes to the Christian walk. We're talking about how we can make mistakes along the way. And those mistakes affect all of us. You know, they affect us personally. They affect our families and our friends. They affect uh, our witness. We were talking about that this morning at the 9 o'clock uh, session next door here. We are talking about witnessing. And, and mistakes can be one of those things that can really it can enhance somebody's growth or it can deter it. It could bring somebody closer to you. Or maybe it chases them away because they look at you and say, well, you know, you're supposed to be a Christian, but look at all the mistakes you make. You're just a hypocrite. Well, I'll be the first one to tell him, yeah, and there's always room for another one, right? We're, we're making choices all the time. Sometimes the choices are, are, we go to Starbucks and we say, you know, I want a, what are the words they use? Grande and Latte. what? Lat, huh, lattes and cappuccinos and, and you know, mochas and uh, tall grandes. And do you want skim? Do you want it skinny? Do you want this? Do you want all these choices we have to make? What's that? Hot or cold. Yeah, hot or cold. Ice, you know, oh, my gosh. Sometimes we make choices that are um, a little more difficult sometimes, like with an eye chart, you know. Which one is clearer? You know, the second line or the fourth line or those types of things? Huh? Yeah, I know. I, when I put, pull that up, I'm like, dang, I need to go to what the <laughs> I mean, is that thing really that out of focus or is it just me? Huh? Life is blurry. I like that. Maybe we should have that on the sign. <laughs> Life is better blurry. Today we're talking about choices, and we're talking about how those choices can be something that really affects our walk with Christ and also others' walk with Christ. I'm going to read a scripture to you, and it'll be on the screen. It comes in the book of Matthew. Matthew is kind of an interesting guy because it, the overall theme of the book of Matthew is he's kind of laying it out there uh, in, in the terms that those people would understand. Uh, in their context, so to speak. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. Isn't that interesting? So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which do you want me to release to you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? Jesus was actually a very common name. For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priest and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you, asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah, Pilate asked. And they all answered, crucify him. Why, what crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. And when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, 
but that instead an uproar was starting. He took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. And all the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he handed Jesus, or had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. You know, a familiar story, a familiar part of the gospel that, that we uh, celebrate. Uh, it's part of a pretty gruesome picture, though, is this, you know, man, Pilate, standing there with Jesus, who has been flogged and beaten and, and, you know, torn to pieces overnight. And, and he's standing there in front of this mob of people that it, it just want him to die. Today, we're talking about choices. There's so many choices in this scriptural story. The most obvious choice, of course, is the one that is made by the chief priests, by the elders in the religious community, and, of course, by the people. They had to choose between Jesus, who was the king of the Jews, or this guy called Barabbas. And Barabbas was not an, a nice man. Uh, there are some historical documents that say he was a murderer. It, others that say he was an insurrectionist. Others say he was fighting for a cause. And, you know, this, but from what we know about this man, Barabbas, he was accused correctly. The people that day chose very poorly because they chose to send Jesus to the cross, even though he had done nothing wrong. Let me set the stage to you, or for you. They're in Jerusalem at this point. There are tons of people. As they came to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, the Passover was a celebration that they did every year to celebrate when the Israelites were released from Egypt, from bondage, and, and the Spirit of God hovered over all of the Egyptian households and took the firstborn. And yet they had painted the lamb's blood on the outside of their homes and the Spirit of God passed over them. That was a huge celebration. And people and families would travel great distances to come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. The Pharisees and the religious authorities in this particular scene did not have the authority to put Jesus to death. They did not have the authority. Under Jewish law, he had done nothing that gave them the authority to crucify him. But the religious leaders knew that the Romans could. Hence, that's the reason that Jesus ends up in front of Pilate, because he really was the only one back then who had the authority to send Jesus to the cross. Back to choices again, the choices that Pilate himself had to make. Historians believe from various different documents that Pilate was a very corrupt individual. He was corrupt. He had fought his way up the chain of command, if you will, in, in Roman government. Uh, he was a cruel individual. There are documents that show that he thought very little of life didn't really mean a whole lot to him. What meant everything to him was that he had control of the people. Because if he didn't have control of the people and Caesar had to send in troops or whatever, it looked pretty bad on this guy who was the governor called Pilate. I mean, his whole career, his livelihood, probably his family too, were at stake. And Pilate was, like I said, he wasn't a very nice guy. He was he was a ruthless individual. He was corrupt to his core. He was relentless in, in obtaining that control over the community. But one of the things that historians have discovered is he also had an extremely bad temper. Pilate, I mean, he was like a light switch. He was the one that would just fly off the handle, make decisions on the rough make decisions based on his emotions and his feelings. As we look at this, this conversation, this one-way conversation mostly, that takes place between Pilate and Jesus, 
Pilate at this point seems to be very calm. He's not yelling, he's not screaming, he's not saying things that he wish he hadn't said, he's not embarrassing himself in front of the people. But Pilate chooses a way out. He chooses to give the people an opportunity to release this man that he realizes um, hasn't done anything wrong. Pilate, even though life to him doesn't mean a whole lot, there's some inkling of something going on inside of his heart where rather than just be gone with him, do with him what you want, he offers them an opportunity to have him back. Let him be crucified, they continue to yell. Pilate realized that that's not going to work. I can't just pawn him off. They won't choose him. They've chosen this other man, Barabbas. And Pilate now is left again with a decision that many times you and I have in our life. A decision that is tough, difficult. Pilate doesn't necessarily agree with their, their decision to turn Jesus over for a flogging and turn him over to go to the cross. So what does Pilate do? In the story, Pilate gets a bowl of water. And he has this bowl of water brought to him. And in front of all the people, he sits there and he, he washes his hands. And then he holds his hands up like this so that the water runs the full length of his forearm and then drips off of his elbows. Why? Because that was a tradition that the religious leaders performed at the temple. They would have understood this completely. It was one of the rituals that the religious leaders, before they offered a sacrifice, would cleanse themselves with. It was a way of saying that they've washed away um, through the sacrifice that's coming the, the blood of their own sin. And they've let it drip off so that their forearms stay perfectly clean. You see, they would have understood that Pilate was saying to them, you're sinning and I'm not going to be a part of it. I'm washing myself clean of this poor decision that you've made. But hasn't Pilate made even a worse decision? He's taken an innocent man, a man that's done nothing wrong, and going to turn him over to the mob. Does that really absolve him from any guilt or any? No. Pilate knew that he was innocent. And he asked them, he said, what evil has he done? Pilate's pretty cunning at this point because he knows that it is a answer, not a rhetorical question. It's something that they can't give him an answer to. What has he done wrong? Why? Why do you want to crucify him? Pilate lets Jesus go to the cross anyway. Anyway. Why? You know what Pilate's problem was? You know what the failure his big time failure was expediency. He simply wanted to get this problem over with and out of his sight. He wanted to get it out of the, the realm of anything that they were dealing with right away. He didn't want this thing to drag on because if it dragged on, the crowd might become even more unruly. And if he lost control, if Rome heard that the governor had lost control of Jerusalem, then it wouldn't be good especially not for Pilate. Faced with the possibility that Jesus might even be a threat to his own rule there because the people were following him in droves. But on this day, the people had turned away and the people were incited to, to cry out, crucify him. Pilate looks at this crowd and he sees this crowd that is on the verge of a riot. And he chooses his expediency. Let it happen. Is this what you want? Let it go down. This is probably the best way for me to keep my job. 
This is probably the best way for me to get these religious leaders off my back and to settle the crowd down before they become a real problem. I need to get rid of this problem and maintain control because that is exactly what Rome is expecting. And if they hear anything different, any other rumors different, then it could be trouble. He could have stood up for Jesus. He asked them the question, what has he done that deserves crucifixion? A question that they couldn't answer. But what did he choose to do? He chose to let an innocent man die because it was too much of a problem, a problem that he needed to get rid of right now. You know, sometimes we're fear, we fear losing control. It's one of the biggest challenges, I think, in most Christians' life is losing control over what we have built, what we are building, where we are going, losing control over what we think is, you know, the right direction or the right way to do things. And, and we're, we're reluctant to turn over the control to God for his plans and for his purposes. I think Pilate that day felt those, all of those things. Fear, too, of what might happen if he didn't send an innocent man to die. He seemed to be more concerned about maintaining peace and order than right and wrong. Again, for a ruthless man, a person that doesn't really value life at all, maybe that was an easy choice for him. Maybe it wasn't. I don't really know. I think he struggled with it. I think he pushed it to his own limit when he stood before them and said, why? And then he washes his hands in front of them, trying to make himself feel somewhat better. At least he can go back and tell his wife, you know, well, I got your message, but the crowd was crazy today, and I just washed my hands of it all. You ever done that? You ever a situation where you washed your hands of it? In hindsight, was it always the right thing? I mean, did we wash our hands because we were doing the right thing by washing our hands of it, or are we just because it was easy or easier or expedient? On the college campuses sometimes, I read stories every once in a while about young people. They go into a um, uh, situation in a new campus. They are just out of high school, and they get there, and life is good, and they're experiencing new things, and, and you know, it's different than where I came from. It's more free than what I came from. I, oh, it's going to be hard to live for Jesus in these surroundings. So what do you do? Do you stand up for what's right, or do you do what's expedient? Eh, I'll just go along with it. You know, everybody else. Eh, whatever. It looks like fun. What the heck? Yeah. Oh, Jesus will forgive me later. You know, I, uh, hold on to that thought, Jesus. I'll be back with you after the weekend. You know what I'm saying. We don't always have to give in to those things. We don't always have to give in to the fear or the anxieties or the sense that we need to be expedient with whatever the situation is. You know, I'm as guilty as anybody. Sometimes it's just plain easier to let something go, to sometimes do the wrong thing. Jesus could have silenced this whole thing with one word. Do you realize that? This mob is out there telling him to be crucified. They're putting him in the position of a criminal. They're going to take his life. They've already beat the crap out of him. Uh, the, you know, all of these things, Jesus did not have to endure. He needs one word, and he could have just ended the whole thing. But in comparison to the decision that Pilate was making, Jesus didn't take the quick way out, did he? No. 
He fulfilled scripture by being silent before his accusers. He went to the cross. He was beaten the night before. He, he hung there. He suffered. He died for the sins of the world. I mean, he did not take the expedient way out in any way, shape, or form. None. And yet the whole time he could have just said, enough is enough. The choice that Jesus made really gives us an empowerment to make the same type of choices in our life, to live for Christ because of what he's done, to sometimes take the difficult way and not the easy way. It's, it's part of the Christian walk, really. You know, When I look at the sacrifice of Jesus, and the more I contemplate what it really meant to go to a cross, it just shows me more and more and more of how deep his love was for each one of us. In class once, we did a study on what it meant to go to the cross. And actually, I think there have been a few books written about it. One of the things we looked at was from a medical sense, from a doctor's point of view, what did the cross look like? What did it mean to go to the cross, to go through a flogging and to be, you know, uh, carrying a cross of that weight through the, you know, a certain distance and then to be hung on this thing, whether it was with ropes or it was with spikes. Really, at the same time, Jesus was proving his divinity. Most of the time when a person was condemned to the cross, they never made it to the portion that the crowd enjoyed sometimes, the show part, the hanging them up on the cross, watching them suffer. Most of the time they didn't really get the full 40 lashes either. You know why? Because there would be so much blood loss, they would die before they ever got to the cross. And yet Jesus takes a beating the night before. He takes 40 lashes and then he carries his own cross. And then he hangs in there, not willing to give up his spirit until hours and hours later. Think about the difference in the choice that Jesus made that day and the choice that Pilate made. Pilate was willing to send an innocent man to that kind of a death. And yet Jesus said, I'll take that kind of a death for you. I don't know about you guys, but I look at that on a very personal level. I look at that and say, wow, Jesus took on and experienced something that I never could. I never could. Really, it's, it's far beyond the ability of a human being to experience the cross. That's one of the reasons they used to give them this stuff called gall. It was a narcotic. It was meant to dull the senses. It was to put them in a state of stupor so that they at least kept a ble beating heart while they were hanging there because the pain would be so intense it would shut down a human's mind. The mind would disconnect itself from the body. It would just turn itself off in many cases because of the an immense, enormous amount of pain. And yet Jesus, he took it all. The choice that he makes compared to the one Pilate made, especially when Pilate would have known, he would have been very, very, very well acquainted with what Jesus was going to experience on that cross. So what does that mean to me and what does that mean to you? What does it mean that, that Jesus was willing to experience that, to take that on for me? What does it mean that Jesus was willing to go through all of that when at any moment he could have said enough is enough? Doesn't that affect the choices that we make in our life? Sometimes I make too many choices like Pilate. 
Sometimes I make too many choices like Peter. Sometimes I make too many choices like Mary Magdalene. As we look at the scripture, we look at the stories, we look at all the people that have been involved with, with the gospel of Jesus, what we see is a conglomeration of people that have made very poor choices. Very, very poor choices. The Bible is not a Bible filled with superstars. It's a, it's a book that is filled with broken people. People that understand that the sacrifice that Jesus made, the choice that Jesus made was on our behalf. The choice that Pilate made was on his own behalf. And it leaves us in the same boat. The choice that you and I need to make. Now, I, I submit to you that we need to make that choice on a daily basis. Because today, the world might be lovely. All chocolate ice cream and whipped cream and everything is wonderful, right? Tomorrow might be Brussels sprouts. Yeah. Huh? Yes, it can. <laughs> and we need to realize that it's, it's in those difficult times as well as the good times that we should make the choice that Christ made. Difficult stuff. Yeah, I made it. <laughs> the night that he was betrayed. Think about this now. Beaten up. He knew he was going to the cross. He knew he was going to suffer immensely. We can only guess at what took place after he left this world and where he went and how he provided for the salvation of others, the suffering that he endured. And yet he still sat there with the disciples. He might as well have been sitting there with you and I. He said, Joe, my body is going to be broken for you and for the remission of your sins. Now that day, I might not have understood all that. Today, we can look back and understand it. We can look back on our own lives and say, there's been good times, there have been bad. But you know what? I don't have to be condemned. That's the good news part. It's not an excuse to sin. It's just that Jesus has paid for the price of my own faults, my own sins. He has made the choice. That day he suffered on the, cr on the cross. He suffered for every single sin of my life, the ones I haven't even thought of doing yet. Why is it that I forget that sometimes? Don't. We should all be filled with joy as we leave this place. Why? Because we're redeemed. Because of the choice that he made, knowing that his perfect choice would cover over our imperfect choices. He took the cup and he said, this is the cup of my blood, blood of, of a new covenant, which will be shed for you and for all so that the sins of your life can be forgiven. You, you, don't miss that part. It's a covenant. A covenant is what? It's an agreement. It's a promise. It's Jesus saying to you, I've made the, cho I've made the choice, and now I'm fulfilling the choice. Your job is to make the same type of choice for me.